Uh, Hello Western Civ 1. <laughs> I uh, don't really have things I've got to show you with the camera facing the right direction. I'm sure you realize by now that what you're looking at is actually a mirror image of my face. So I, I can't show you any printed matter, maps, pictures, anything, or it's a mirror image of what you need to see. But while I'm talking to you, it's good enough, I guess. Um, so well, let's move ahead. Talking about the Franks, Clovis founded a dynasty. He became the first Christian king of the Franks, and he was a great warrior who conquered most of what is now France and Belgium and established the Franks as the dominant people there. That's why the region is called France today from the Franks. But Clovis, when he died, left his kingdom to his sons. Now, notice I said sons in the plural, because unfortunately, the Franks had a tradition of leaving their estates to all their sons. The daughters sometimes got something, um, but often it was assumed the daughters would have been married off to wealthy men in their younger adulthoods, and uh, that, that that wasn't their dad's problem anymore when he died to leave them in the will. They could be uh, taken care of. It was permitted, but it just wasn't always done. But the sons split up the father's estate when he died. Now, this is a problem if you're a king, right? Are you going to divide your large kingdom among three, four sons? Will they be content with that? <laughs> Maybe the oldest son saw daddy reign an area the size of modern France. Is he going to be content with one quarter of that as his inheritance? Will a junior son who thinks he's smarter, braver, greater warrior, more effective leader than an older brother be content to let the older brother have as much as he does and not try to take it? Well, your answer to both of those is no. And this was a major problem for centuries for the Franks. This custom of dividing up daddy's estate when he died among the sons would mean perpetual warfare between the members of the royal family and periodically one would win the day and make himself king of most or all of the, the major Frankish, command, Frankish kingdom. But over time, all that warfare, all that division, wore down the dynasty that Clovis founded. His dynasty was called the Merovingians, the Merovingian dynasty of the Franks. Um, slowly but surely, the senior son, who kept being crowned king, no longer controlled, in reality, most of the kingdom. And with ongoing civil wars like this for centuries, really local power fell to the hands of nobles. There was still a king of the Franks, but he wasn't really the ruler anymore. Um, instead, the, the aristocrats looked for their sort of binding force, not to the kings. The kings were sacred symbols to the Franks, but they weren't real leaders anymore. After, you know, 150 years after Clovis, nobody expected the Frankish king to actually lead armies into battle. In fact, because of their tendency to marry inside their family to cousins and the like, uh, mental, mental defect uh, became pretty common in the Merovingian kings. They often were not very bright uh, and had other uh, mental difficulties. Uh, and so the last of the Merovingian kings literally was carted around as an ox cart to sacred festivals. That was pretty much what he did. He was the most trivial of figureheads. But you might say, well, who was it that bound Frankish society together if it wasn't the kings? Well, interestingly enough, it was called the mayors of the palace, they're called the mayors of the palace. But mayor in Latin means greatest. So the greatest aristocrat of the palace. We might call them prime minister. Uh, the king is still there, and technically the mayor of the palace worked under the king. But in reality, the mayors of the palace ran the Frankish kingdom. 
Well, the crucial mayor of the palace, the one who really will play a pivotal role in the history of Western civilization, was a guy named Charles, or Carolus in Latin, Carl in German, Charles in French, Charles the Hammer. He was called the Hammer because he was such a fierce warrior. And he was a charismatic war leader, just the kind of man you'd think would lead Frankish armies. He was small in stature, but built like a barrel, you know, like a, uh, well, like football fullbacks used to be back in the day. Uh, real stocky, very powerfully built, not tall, but powerful. And, and a charismatic leader. You know what that expression means? There are some people who are just naturally leaders. You just gravitate to them. The, the natural kid who gets chosen as the quarterback when you divide up uh, teams for football, that kind of thing. Well, that was Charles, the mayor of the palace, in the early 700s. <clears throat> there still was technically a king, but he was the real leader of the Franks. And he played an absolutely pivotal role at the Battle of Tours in 732 A.D., that's one of those key dates. I've mentioned it already, but it's the kind that belongs with a star by it in your memory. 732 AD. This is the Battle of Tours. T-O-U-R-S. The S doesn't get pronounced in French. So it's the Battle of Tours. Tours was a town in southern France. It was essentially the capital of the southern region of the Frankish kingdom, the major town. But keep in mind, in the early Middle Ages, when I say a major town, I mean six or 7,000 people. That's what passed for a city in the early Middle Ages in Western Europe. Anytime you got more than 1,000 people, that became a big place in the early Middle Ages. But Tours was an important town. And in 732, an Islamic army, remember they had been in Spain for about, 60 years at this point, crossed the Pyrenees Mountains. Those are the large mountains that divide France and Spain. A large Muslim army invaded the Frankish kingdom from the south. Charles gathers together an army. The, the, the nobles of the Franks sent him warriors, and he was the commander-in-chief as the mayor of the palace. And outside the city of Tours, near the modern-day town of Poitiers, in 732 AD, a pivotal battle for the history of Western civilization took place. Charles's forces slammed into the Islamic armies, armies that had won battle after battle for the better part of a century in Spain, made this deep probe into France, and the Franks beat them. They beat them and chased them out of the Frankish kingdoms. Now, this wasn't the end of warfare with the Muslims. There would be war on both sides of the Pyrenees for a couple of hundred years to come. But never again would an Islamic army get that deep into Western Europe. So the mere fact that you're going to a Christian church today may very well depend on the fact that Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer, defeated the Islamic forces at the Battle of Turin in 732. They had had essentially nothing but success in expanding Islam uh, until then. And that was it. That was the high watermark in Western Europe of Islamic expansion. Uh, they, they pushed them back behind the Pyrenees, and there they stayed after 732. Now, what would take, as I mentioned, the Reconquista of Spain would take uh, the better part of 700 years uh, to accomplish more than 700 years, actually. So Muslims were not driven from Western Europe. They're still in Spain and what's now Portugal, but never would they push into France, uh, the Low Countries. They never, of course, invaded England or Germany or Italy because of this victory. Very important in determining the history, the future history of the world. Well, Charles was a very effective war leader, and he was the foremost noble in the Frankish kingdom. There still is a, a, a Merovingian Frankish king, but like I said, they were 
imbeciles carted about in ox carts that just were brought out for like public festivals. The mayors of the palace really ran things. And when Charles died, he left his, not throne, but his job as mayor of the palace to his son Pippin, P-I-P-P-I-N, Pippin, sometimes written P-E-P-I-N, Pippin. But Pippin the Short, <laughs> these things are called epithets, Charles Martel, which comes from the Latin word for hammer, Charles the Hammer, Pippin the Short, apparently the the family of Charles, never the men were never of enormous stature. Well, they were powerful men, physically strong men. Um, Pepin uh, was an, a more effective administrator than his father had been. And he got the finances of the Frankish kingdom on an even keel um, and maintained, you know, the defense of the southern border from the Muslim armies and so on. He was a very effective leader. But he was rankled. He said, why is it that this idiot in the ox cart with a crown on his head gets bowed and scraped to, and I'm just a nobleman who supposedly works for him? So Pepin wrote a letter to the Pope. Remember, the Franks had this close relationship with the popes in Rome for hundreds of years. Writes a letter to the Pope and says, Your Holiness, might it be God's will that a people as mighty and as important to the kingdom of God as the Franks be ruled by an idiot? Should it not be a man who has proved himself capable? And the Pope writes back and says, you're right. I'm sure it's the will of God that you make yourself king. So Pepin the Short took the crown from the last Merovingian king and crowned himself king of the Franks. So that's the end of the Merovingian dynasty. And it is the beginning of the Carolingian dynasty, Carolingian. So anytime you hear me use the word Carolingian from here on, it's referring to the family of Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer. Charles the found, is the, the leading figure, the mayor who, who defeated the Muslims in 732 at the Battle of Tours. His son Pepin, the first Carolingian to become king of the Franks. And then Pepin's son Charles becomes known as Charles the Great, Carolus Magnus, Charlemagne, Charlemagne, will, uh, will be the greatest of all the Carolingians, the man who refounds the empire in Western Europe. So Pepin, when he crowns himself king, you know, has changed the dynasty. But when he died, he did the normal thing. He divided his kingdom between three sons. Charles was one of them. His brothers and his nephews and his cousins, and he will get involved in civil war. Civil war. Um, and sometimes a civil war was a bloody business. Sometimes it was having what looks like it's supposed to be a peace meeting, and then one side butchers the other. Uh, the, these... I did comment that these were Christians, but by now you figured out Christians don't always lie, act like followers of Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, the Franks could be pretty nasty customers. Just because they were the Pope's favorite Germanic warriors doesn't mean that they were always meek and mild. They were almost never meek and mild. And uh, Charles the Great will become sole king of all of the Frankish lands by defeating in battle and in a couple of occasions simply assassinating other male members of his own family. Now Charlemagne will go on to become a great ruler, a legendary ruler, very, very important in the history of Western civilization. But we don't want to sugarcoat things and pretend he wasn't a tough customer. And in his civilization, killing your relatives might be necessary for the good of the kingdom as he saw it. Not not the way a follower of Christ should live in their lives, I would say, but that's how it was done in those days in that place. Very rough world. Anyway, next lecture, we'll talk more about Charlemagne, the greatest Frankish ruler. Thank you.